from William and Mary's Raymond A. Mason School of Business and the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance. This is the 757 Recovery Podcast, a limited run podcast series dedicated to helping the Hampton Roads community navigate the economic and social changes brought about by COVID-19. Today's episode is all about restaurants and retail. Our host will be Jeffrey Rich, Chief Marketing Officer at William and Mary's Raymond A. Mason School of Business. Today, I'll be joined by two stellar retail connoisseurs within the Hampton Roads community. William and Mary Professor of Business, Chris McCoy, and Regional Director for the Virginia Farmers Market Association for Richmond, Caleb Miller. Chris McCoy and I will have a one-on-one discussion regarding the impact of COVID-19 on the retail industry. Chris joined the faculty of William and Mary as an assistant professor in 2018. He earned a master's in accounting and a PhD in accounting from the University of Alabama. He also holds a BA in history from the University of Florida. He holds an active CPA license from the state of Virginia and is an active CMA. Chris's research focuses on financial markets and accounting information, and he's been partially funded by a competitive international grant to continue his research. After my discussion with Chris McCoy, the two of us will be joined by Caleb Miller. Caleb is the Food Connection Program Manager for Healthy Chesapeake, an organization focused on improving the quality of life around the Chesapeake area. Caleb has over a decade of experience in nonprofit and sustainable food systems management. He earned his Master of Science in Sustainable Food Systems at Green Mountain College and is in the process of earning a PhD for leadership and change at Antioch University. On top of that, he is also the Regional Director for the Virginia Farmers Market Association for Richmond, where he aims to increase the professionalism of farmers markets throughout the Commonwealth. So Chris, it's it's like the wild west out there with retail right now. States pursuing different policies in terms of you know openings, and nobody's sure when the economy is going to be fully roaring back. But what when you look across the horizon of retail right now and look at the the issues that retail was experiencing even before the pandemic, what does the future look like from your point of view? Um, I mean, it, it is hard to say. Uh, of course, I mean, we already had uncertainty in retail before the pandemic. Uh, but my thoughts are that retail is going to have to continue to change as it has, um, but not lose sight of what makes a brick and mortar retail unique. So keeping, uh, be, keep, keeping it being an attractive place for people to shop, uh, keeping it being a comfortable place for people to be where they can interact with other people, other customers and the like. What would you say to the small to medium sized retailer in the local market who has no choice but to to look at or to consider taking on debt to sustain operations? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? You know, what would be the advice that you might give somebody who's thinking about taking on additional store bet debt to try and, uh, and make it through? Yeah, I guess my primary thought would be there's no reason to reinvent the wheel. So if what you were doing pre pandemic was working, and you were able to sustain customers and sales and you had a good uh, grouping of customers. I don't think there's necessarily a reason to take on more debt in order to start selling online or to change your business model significantly. But if you're a business that was not doing well before or was having some, some difficulties with sales and, and market share, now also might be a good time to think about how do I, how do I change what I'm doing? Because if, if you want to keep going, now would be a time to potentially uh, – to and I don't want anybody to go beyond what their, their means or, or put themselves such in debt that it's going to create a difficulty in their lives, but it may be an opportunity to invest in a different direction. Um, right now we're at incredibly low rates. Uh, so, and I think that will continue for the foreseeable future. I'm not an economist, but um, until things start turning around, it seems like borrowing is going to be inexpensive, less expensive. Um, so is this disruption going to last a while? Yes. Uh, if borrowing has to happen in order to sustain uh, through the, d- the difficult times, uh, it, it really becomes an existential choice. Do we want the business to keep going or do we want to take on loans? And if we don't want to take on loans, then we have to potentially run the risk of the business not continuing. Have you come across any guidelines for um, retailers that would help them assess operational models 
that can form with uh, best practices with regard to the pandemic. The references on the CDC website to policies and procedures are, are recommendations, just that. They don't, they're, no, they're not positioned as requirements. So it seems like uh, retailers and restaurants in the area are gonna have a lot of discretion um, to not just when they reopen, uh, but how they approach the reopening. Does that worry you that there isn't more um, required standardization of these processes? It just seems to leave a lot of room for problems to occur. It just seems like an accident that might be waiting to happen. Yeah, and I do, but I also understand that if we're, if we're going to write rules, we'd have to spend huge amounts of time thinking about the implications of those, getting community inputs, uh, things like that, which are, are, t are, are time intensive, right? And so uh, if we want to be flexible and be quick about it, the recommendations is probably about as far as can be gone. Uh, so pragmatically speaking, uh, it's, a, it's, I think, the best possible solution. But I think that's why thinking about, thinking about how do I protect my employees um, from, from getting sick and how do I protect my uh, employees from, how do I prevent my employees from spreading uh, illness to other employees? The one point that I liked the most from the reducing transmission among employees recommendations from the CDC was um, to identify where and how um, employees might be exposed. And so if we take the time to think about operations, think about when is it that employees are gonna be close to each other? When is it that employees are going to likely default to being close to each other? So even if we put a line uh, down and say, you need to stay apart, how do we actually manage to not have the two of the, those employees getting close to each other constantly? Yeah. You know, I know you've had a lot of uh, experience in, in restaurant, in the restaurant sector uh, as well, but, you know, that seems such a pessimistic outlook for at least the next few months with yeah. restaurants only being able to open up to a minimal capacity with distancing between tables and, and patrons. Um, and, and they operate on razor thin margins to begin with most restaurants. So yeah. how does that financial model possibly work if you can't even open your doors to full capacity? I've worked in, I've worked in a lot of restaurants in a lot of different locations. And, uh, and I think most people in the restaurant business would agree with this is that the best kind of business is steady, right? So having an enormous lunch rush at 11.45 that's over by 12.15 and then being dead until five o'clock is a, is a tricky operation. So I think the capacity problem will certainly affect peak times, but there probably is an ability to smooth out the business across the time that wasn't there before the pandemic. And so my thoughts about how would restaurants be able to do well in that is, is to make sure they have uh, enticements and make sure they have staffing in place to handle customers at three o'clock. I think it would be more likely for those kinds of enticements to work in this condition because people have more flexibility in their schedules. When I, I, I worked at a, a business that was affected by a tornado and it was, it was huge parts of the town were affected by the tornado. So some businesses didn't reopen right away. Some didn't reopen at all. So there was definitely shifts in demand. Um, but that short period of time, maybe a week or two after the tornado, uh, people often weren't going to work because we had prolonged power outages in town and the like. And it was much steadier than we usually were. Um, of course, we weren't under any capacity constraints, uh, but there were people there in the middle of the day when we never would have had that. You know, on a weekday at three in the afternoon, it would typically have been dead. And all of a sudden, you know, because people weren't having to go to work or, or weren't going to work from nine to five in conventional ways, they were suddenly out and about in times they didn't used to be out and about. You know, another trend that might be interesting to sort of, you know, rekindle is um, a few years back, home meal replacement among retail retailers was a growing sector. Um, you know, it seems like that might be a different way for uh, a restaurant to look at um, serving their customer base. It isn't just the ordering the pizza or the, the Chinese food, you know, on a Friday night, but family meals, um, larger portions, different pricing yeah. schedules to accommodate that, or even going all in on that home meal replacement strategy and saying, you know, we're going to prepare uh, casseroles that can be used, you know, as a family meal through the course of a week. Yeah, I, I think so. And even things like if you're talking, you're talking about a restaurant, the idea of of those sort of family meals and that and the like, that would allow you to deliver a, a high value product to your customer that doesn't involve people standing shoulder to shoulder, you know, because you can make those in batches, you can make those ahead of time, 
you can make those when you know, even way before anyone would come in and want to eat, you know, make those at seven in the morning and the like and have them ready to go when you can very easily run the restaurant without people being shoulder to shoulder. One of the things I was thinking about specifically in restaurants is there's probably going to have to be some thought made about menus, right? So if you're in a restaurant that has control over the menu, uh, perhaps designing menus that don't necessitate employees interacting with each other. Um, you're thinking of if you're making a, a salmon salad and you've got one employee who makes that salad and the other employee who puts the salmon on top of it, um, is that an item that you can still make without people having to interact and be really close to each other? But if we can say move some things off, and again, this might be a menu uh, change, but if we can move some things off of the, uh, the line and move them back into a prep kitchen where we can make those earlier and make those in a place where we're not having to stand shoulder to shoulder, um, and then being able to still deliver a high quality product, but deliver one that doesn't necessitate, you know, four or five people standing on the line uh, within close proximity to each other. Well, I think these were some great suggestions, Chris. And um, you know, I want to thank you for, uh, for lending your expertise um, to our discussion and hopefully uh, providing some, some things to think about and some good takeaways for our listeners. Yeah. And thank you for the opportunity. I hope it helps. Very much so. So thanks again, and uh, you have a wonderful rest of the day. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. See you later. We'd like to take a moment to introduce our partners, Crim Dell Small Business Network. We understand that as a small business, these times of crisis can be riddled with uncertainty. Crim Dell, in association with the Hampton Roads SBDC, is offering free 10-hour counseling services to small business owners within the greater Williamsburg area to help navigate your business through the pandemic. To learn more, reach out at crimdellsbn at gmail.com or follow them on Facebook. So our discussion on retail doesn't have to stop here. Now joining Chris and myself is Caleb Miller, Food Connection Program Manager for Healthy Chesapeake. So Caleb Miller is joining us. Caleb, welcome to the podcast. Tell us a little bit about your, yourself and Healthy Chesapeake. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, my name is Caleb Miller. I'm the Food Connection Program Manager for Healthy Chesapeake. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and we are the population health arm for the Chesapeake Health Department. And uh, our goal is to improve population health. The Food Connection Program is designed to help improve food security and access to healthy foods to our community, um, which has been extremely important and relevant in, during COVID. So we've created a farmer's market that is online with curbside pickup model. And that's been built in response to COVID containment procedures and uh, to still help farmers have a platform to make their wares and foodstuffs available to our community. So just for clarification, Caleb, so is that a, do you replicate that model at uh, farmer's markets around the region or uh, have you helped a particular farmer's market develop a curbside pickup capability? So this is a, a pilot we've done here in Chesapeake solely that I, that we're going to replicate in different areas throughout Chesapeake. So we have one pickup location right now. We're getting ready to expand to a second site in Western Branch. Chesapeake's a large area. We have about nine planning areas. So we hope to have new pickup locations and dates um, as we proceed. So trying right now to drive customer traffic to the areas and, and build support. And just uh, with the more people that we have in each area, then the more locations that we can reach. Fantastic. Well, we've got also, uh, obviously, so with us here, Professor Chris McCoy, an expert in uh, retail and, and restaurants. How can, uh, I guess, Caleb, what questions do you have for, uh, for Professor McCoy? Well, I, we have a team, a really experienced farmers management team that came together as a, as a work team to develop this model in response to COVID when it first broke out. And we worked really hard to develop a workaround that was compliant with COVID-19 containment procedures, but also allowed us to have some form of farmer's market. So I, I guess it's a two-part question. Have you seen other retail or, or industries that have created similar kind of workarounds or interesting things that have been adapted from COVID? And then also, um, what's the potential? Like for farmer's markets, I get a lot of questions about will we continue to do the online market in, accord in addition to uh, in-person traditional farmer's markets? So that's something we aspire to do in the future. And maybe is that an adaption in the post-COVID world that you'll see in other uh, retail 
So I'll tell you, Caleb, I was in uh, restaurant retail management for about 10 years. So I have a lot of you know, frontline experience doing these sorts of things. I also had the experience of managing through a couple of natural disasters, sort of not anywhere near the long term sort of implications, but some short term stuff. And so I've, I've seen it kind of in, the, in the, that perspective a lot. And so if I'm thinking from that experience and also from what I know about the retail sector currently, in answer to the second question, I think that if the online works, I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to see if that works, right? Because it's sort of a necessity at the time. But if it doesn't work, I think it can be something that's pretty costly to maintain. And like you're saying, driving customer traffic is, is going to, I think, continue to be a challenge. So I think, you know, a lot of retail has tried to do the online, but I don't think it's necessarily going to be a long-term strategy for them, right? I mean, so they're going to have to reopen or they're, or they're not going to be able to sustain the business. And I, I think you can kind of see a number of retail and restaurant bankruptcies, which would tell me that switching to online, I used to work for Ruby Tuesday about a decade ago, and I saw that they are closing an enormous number of stores. So clearly they weren't one that could turn into an online retailer. And so I think that where the customers can be driven is probably going to be the people who want to help sustain that business. I don't know what reach, what ability you have to reach people who are activists for keeping community business going. So it may not be the traditional customers that would have been coming to the farmer's market as much as perhaps a new segment of customers that are willing to support the market, realizing that it won't sustain if, if it's not supported. Have you been able to tap into those sorts of markets? We are looking at uh, pulling in an advertising partner to help us reach these targeted customer segments. The 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 local foodies, the uh, the local vores, and just the Chesapeake citizens who who understand the importance of uh, supporting one another. It's it's farmers, it's local food artisans, and and all of them that we're trying to uh, just create a platform, a workaround in this time of need. Because otherwise, uh, you see it in the news. You have growers and farmers just throwing away their produce while we simultaneously have uh, people quietly hungry at home. So I, I think right. that where we can create this model to bridge the gap between the two and keep it hyper local. Um, I did look at the phase two guidance from, from the state to have a better understanding of some of the challenges for reopening that y'all might have. And you know, one that jumped out at me was for uh, people who are accepting cash had to wash hands after every transaction. And just knowing that just seemed incredibly unlikely to happen, just logistically. So it seemed like there was some challenges in opening like to the community. Is that something y'all are considering? That That is a, a, a sort of barrier. What I would look with that is a type of workaround like contactless on-site purchasing. So you can do the swipe with the credit card. Um, right. We already have that equipment. So we do plan on rolling that out. So I, I, I look at these things as challenges and they're, they're certainly, like you said, they're very clear obstacles. I mean, you, people would just wash their hands for raw and there wouldn't be any flesh left. So right. it, it's something where we would look at that and we'd just find some kind of safe workaround. I think we're using Square. Um, there's all kinds of point of sale platforms that provide that. Is Healthy Chesapeake going that far to create a platform as you try and take these farmers markets to this new model that you're piloting? Does, you know, does that include um, developing uh, a payment platform that those vendors that are at that particular farmer's market can tap into? Are you thinking about things like creating a mobile app to um, you know, allow order processing to occur and, and curbside pickup? But how far uh, is Healthy Chesapeake taking this idea? Yes, we currently have an online website that's the ordering that we've developed. Uh, we have some exciting stuff in the works that I, I can't really speak to right now, but we have some local partners that will help us uh, really improve some things. And an application of a smartphone application is certainly the direction where I think things are going. So uh, we're looking to do that. But yeah, we have a pool of vendors that work with us within our team and Right now they're regional, but we're really, we're onboarding as fast as we can, hyper-local, Chesapeake specific. We want to prioritize Chesapeake growers, Chesapeake vendors, uh, Chesapeake food artisans. And uh, we have half a dozen right now onboarding this week alone. So people are reaching out to us. The need is there. Chris, the, um, you know, the issue of payment mechanisms has been a hot issue in retail, particularly with the pandemic. We've heard stories of uh, some retailers and some some guidance being putting out put out by states, re, um, if not requiring, certainly suggesting that cash no longer be exchanged um, and that it become a, a credit card transaction uh, solely. I've noticed as I've 
I love, I love going to farmer's markets and there's a lot of them in this area. Um, and more times than not, I've noticed at least a number of vendors at a given farmer's market only accept cash. They won't even take a credit card payment. So it seems like those two philosophies are at odds. What does that do in terms of the consumer's desire to transact with that business? Does it, does it not matter anymore? Well, I mean, I think if there's a consumer preference, certainly, and, and I think some of this becomes regionally specific or even the kind of shopping you're doing, right, that you're expecting not to have to pay cash. Like, I don't think the average consumer goes into, you know, Taco Bell grocery store and expects to have to pull cash out. But I think, you know, a lot of consumers are going to, ex- might expect that from farmer's markets. I don't know if, if, if Caleb's experience, but I would think that it would be harder to make people not pay cash, right? It would be because maybe uh, people who are struggling with food security might also be uh, people who wouldn't have credit cards or a cashless uh, payment system. And I think, you know, the real challenge for, for anybody to, to take credit cards instead of cash is that it's not free to take a credit card, right? I mean, it, it is, a, uh, is a costly thing. And if you're already running a business on a, a small margin, then certainly adding a, a 2% or 3% hit off the top is, is going to hurt you. Also, of course, if, you're, if your transaction sizes are relatively small, a lot of those fees uh, stack in a disproportionate way on small transactions. So, um, you know, I can definitely see why it would be difficult to implement. And I, I, I see that logistically and operationally being a challenge, even when the hand washing sink is right there next to where people are operating. And so I think that part pushes it towards cashless, but I'd, it'd have to be, you would have to be really sure that the customer base was prepared to, to be cashless. Yeah. What about um, applications like Venmo and Zelle where there's no transaction fee? Um, you know, Caleb, have you guys explored, you know, those, you know, even in, in newer technology options where um, it's not just a mobile payment um, where you still have to, you know, use a credit card, but you can just basically use your smartphone um, and send the money to a vendor via an email address or a phone number. We have not. That's a really interesting concept. I wrote it down. So maybe we need to bring you in on the work team. Uh, <laughs> well, you we- know, I, I working around students and Chris will attest to this too. Um, you tend to at least hear about, if not um, uh, become a user of the latest technology. And, and yeah. I've noticed that um, that is a, a trend that is hard to miss. You know, they have a, a, a they, they really want to integrate into existing applications. So they have a lot of um, off the shelf kind of things that will help you if you want to integrate that into your platforms. It's not, it shouldn't be as much heavy lifting as kind of developing your own payment system or something. Um, so that, I, I had not thought of that, but that's a really fantastic suggestion. If you're just finding yourself, you know, hey, you're just driving down the street and you're like, hey, there's a farmer's market and I'm going to stop. You know, there's a lot of people who just aren't going to have a lot of cash in their pocket. And if you switch to the cashless systems, even though it might have an upfront cost, might be painful. I think you're going to see an ability to drive more revenue. It's like communication channels. Each customer segment has different ways. So maybe certain individuals listen to the radio, others read print and whatnot. Well, you know, young, young folks are probably going to use credit cards and smartphone apps. And we're all just kind of adapting. And look at us, our meeting right now is on Zoom. And I don't think everybody right. was doing that beforehand. No, I think uh, if, if anything comes out of the pandemic, the normalization of um, video chatting is certainly one of them on a personal and a professional level, I think. Our big issue is the lack of standing inventory. And we have that lag time that's always going to exist. So my job is just to shrink that lag time. So what can we do to shrink that gap and to make it as convenient as possible? So if you order on Monday, maybe you can pick up by Wednesday or drop down arrow and you at least get the selection of dates and times in the location nearest you. How do, how do the, the suppliers know what to deliver? If, if you're, you're saying that like you order it on Monday and somehow right. that information goes to the supplier and the supplier sees it and then fulfills that order, is that kind of how it's right. working? So we have our network of vendors, our growers and food artisans, and uh, our platform really communicates directly to them through our, our management team. So not Healthy Chesapeake, but our partners, Disappearing Deserts. So through the magic of IT, and it's well beyond me, um, they, it's communicated directly to the grower, and then they know what to provide. And then they set, it's working backwards, the pickup date, is based off of the known amount of time it takes to harvest. They're seeing that in more or less real time once they, once the order's placed? Pretty much. And what's important, what we really need to work on and what I want our customers to know 
is the maximum dollar goes directly to the farmers. The, the money goes through transactions straight to the grower. And that's unique. I had two things that jumped to mind, Caleb, with, with what you're talking about. One would be to think about if there is a, a almost like a subscription idea, not necessarily that people pay every time, but that they would say, I really want, you know, a head of lettuce every Wednesday, or I really want such and such item. The other idea would be, it's kind of like, kind of ripping off from Amazon. So it used to be that people would charge for expediting things, but the, the model now has kind of flipped to let people have a discount to delay, right? So you have an upfront charge uh, and if people are willing to say whatever day is conducive to your operation, let's say like you have some extra space on Friday or you know you can deliver stuff in four days better than you can deliver it in two, it's possible that people would be willing to, if you just gave them a small discount to wait. And But you could actually, you essentially you could flip the discount, right? Which is you charge people a little more upfront and so if they take the discount, you're actually charging them what you would have charged before. Because not everybody's going to need it tomorrow, right? And so if you can tap in and, and separate those two customers into who needs it right away, who can delay a day, a week, and be okay, um, I think that might help you logistically sort out um, the limits of the inventory. The subscription idea, it, it really sounds like a CSA type thing. So that's really a, a great thing that's kind of organic to farmers markets anyways, you know, we're all creatures of habit. So if we can make that yeah. as easy as possible and it's in their budget, especially people on fixed budgets like seniors, right. that yeah. would be yeah. a really great thing to uh, incorporate. And I mean, the other thing you could do is essentially create like a wild card, you know, where instead of it being that you get, I don't know, uh, a turn up on Wednesday, it's you get, you know, three different fresh vegetables, right? And so instead of having a, a, a particular, you know, item that you're selecting. It's almost like I'm selecting a five days worth of fresh vegetables or something. What about tapping into, um, you know, the, the market, the, the cottage industry that's already grown up around uh, food delivery with services like Grubhub and build relationships with them where um, they're picking it up just like a, a restaurant order and delivering it? Yeah, I, I think if we had that central location to work out of, that would be a game changer. And that would be... But a, couldn't, but couldn't um, like a Grubhub, you know, like they do today with restaurants, they're going to restaurants all over, uh, you know, and picking it up and taking it to a customer so they can, you know, the point of oh, origin can be the, the grower and the destination, the buyer. Like a decentralized uh, logistics model. Or it's like just an order that comes in like yeah. a, you know, like an order from, uh, from any restaurant. You're picking it up at... Uh, at Denny's and you're delivering it to John Smith on Parker Boulevard. Yeah. Um, I, I think if people are willing to pay the added delivery fee, that would, that would be workable. Um, I just, I, I don't know if people would be willing to do that, but I would love to look at Grubhub, um, Uber Eats, any of these pre, anytime we can take pre-existing infrastructure and adapt it to our yes. current needs. <laughs> yes. I'm a fan of that any day of the week. I would just say, you know, this is feel good food. People can, it's hyper local. People who purchase from us, they're partners in this endeavor. They help us support. And once we reach a threshold in each location, it allows us to set up a second location and a second day, and then the next one, and then the next one. We're all in this together. If we can help get people to understand what we're actually doing and how our model is superior because the maximum amount of money is going to local growers. And that's, that's what it's about. You know, just another idea to throw out is, um, you know, taking a page out of uh, what, what's the sock company Bombas um, that does the buy one, donate one. You know, there might be a play there, especially if you're going after, uh, uh, again, a person with more discretionary income is, you know, if you purchase, you, know, you place your order and then a, rep, a replicate order or, or some items from that grower are also uh, uh, donated to a food shelf or some sort of a food distribution place that helps um, those less fortunate. Yeah, we have a feed it forward option. You can click on that tab and it's where you can buy a pre-sorted box for your neighbor. And, and we would work with one of our partners and donate that to somebody in need. Probably be um, a low income senior that's homebound or uh, at risk youth. So we, we try to focus on uh, disadvantaged communities or vulnerable communities. I appreciate you mentioning that. I like when smart people reflect our, our ideas back to us because it makes me a lot more confident. You're very welcome. And the web address, just for our listeners in case they want to visit? Um, it's healthychesapeake.org. 
you can click right on the, the front homepage there and it'll drive you to our website for the ordering. Well, it's an incredible organization um, doing really important work right now for sure. Hopefully uh, you will not only uh, survive and but thrive through this and develop um, more mechanisms that folks can tap this incredible healthy product that's coming out of your grower population. So best of luck going forward. And uh, we were, again, thankful uh, that you were able to join us today, Caleb. Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful uh, platform. This is my first podcast interview, so I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate the college for making this available. And thank you to all our partners, uh, Chesapeake Health Department, uh, City Council, and just everybody that's been purchasing and supporting us so far. It's really cool. Stay tuned. Stick with us. We're going to continue uh, improving what we do for everybody. So thank you. And there we have it. That concludes our discussion on retail and restaurants with Chris McCoy and Caleb Miller. Thank you to our listeners for joining us here today for the third episode of the 757 Recovery Podcast. I'm your host, Jeffrey Rich. The 757 Recovery Podcast is brought to you by the William and Mary Raymond A. Mason School of Business and the Hampton Roads Economic Development Alliance. Executive producers include Jeffrey Rich and Katie Copey. Associate producers include Kevin Clark, Sophie Morris, Jack Cornett, and Ishan Kantpour.